So episode six of The Wheel of Time, The Flame of Tarvalin. This one came in with some hype, not gonna lie. Critics who have been screeners have been praising this as the best of the six episodes. Some were comparing it to the best episodes of the Game of Thrones. But was it really that good? Was this prestige television at its finest? Or did the episode fall short of its hype? Join me today as I break down what I loved, what I didn't, and give my overall thoughts and reaction to episode six of the Wheel of Time TV show, titled The Flame of Tarvalin. So let's kick this off with a spoiler warning for the video. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers through episode six of the Wheel of Time TV show, but no book spoilers. As long as you've seen the first six episodes of the Wheel of Time, you are good to watch this episode. Now I'm gonna start this review by saying that I'm not even really sure what I think of the episode. I have some very weird thoughts about it. On one hand, this was a very, very well done episode of television. As an adaptation of the Wheel of Time, however, I think there were some issues, but we'll discuss that here in a bit. But let's first start with what I absolutely loved about this episode. And there was a lot that I loved. I feel like the first thing that I almost always have to mention in these reviews is the acting. It is almost obligatory at this point, but the performances in this show have been absolutely outstanding. Rosamund Pike continues to shine as Moraine, and I thought this was by far her best episode. Kate Fleetwood is just stupid good as Leandrin. You absolutely love to hate her. She's killing it every time she's on screen. She's awesome. There have really not been any poor performances so far, but who really stood out to me in this episode was the introduction of Sophie Akinato as Swan Sanche. Now she commanded pretty much every scene she was in, both literally in the show and actually as an actress, but I loved her chemistry with Rosamund Pike. And let's actually talk about the character of Swan for a second. I actually thought the characterization was outstanding. I thought the flashback at the beginning was a really good way of setting up her backstory. And I felt she was pretty true to the books in terms of her demeanor. We didn't get to see her really angry yet, but this was just the first episode we saw her. She was calculated, she was cunning. She's obviously very skilled in the politics of the tower. I also love the pressure surrounding her role. And we can kind of see things closing in around her. One thing I loved about the episode. And to that note, I won't get into spoilers, but there was literally tons and tons of foreshadowing in this episode. Obviously, as this is not a book spoiler video, I'm not gonna get into what those foreshadowing things were, but almost every scene had some form of foreshadowing and I thought that was like outstanding. That bath scene between Moraine and Megan was packed with little hints, like, all over the place. One thing the show is doing that the books do abundantly is lay the groundwork for events to come. These last few episodes have laid the groundwork and there's lots of setup for things to happen later, which I am excited to see. They're doing a great job with that. Let me also talk about some of the interactions between the characters in this episode. Moraine and Leandrin had a couple scenes that were outstanding, but really I can't go through this whole video without talking about Moraine and Swan. They played this relationship out very well up until the point that they met. They were set up to be enemies or at least not working together, exactly like the books. And I love that their relationship from the books was shown in more detail on screen. Screen. We knew that they had some type of a relationship in the books, but it was never explicitly said. But I'm glad that we got to see that they have love for each other, but their duties and sacrifices for the greater good have always come between them. It's sort of a sad story, but it's also very real to their character arcs. I also thought the scenes with Swan and Nynaeve and Egwene were very well done. I loved Nynaeve's fiery energy and the casual way in which Swan sees through all of her insecurities. I cannot wait to see these characters interact some more, especially as the series goes on. In general though, I thought this was the best episode for Moraine by far. She seemed to be in control of a complex situation, and she always seemed to be a step ahead of even when Leandrin threw her for a loop by publicly announcing Nynaeve and all that. The first half of the episode felt as though it was really building up to something, and mostly because it appeared Moraine had a plan. This episode was told pretty much from Moraine's point of view. I think every scene had her in it in some way. So, I want to address the fact that the politics of the White Tower made it into this episode, and that was very well done. I liked the backstabbing and some of the intrigue they showed, and they were again setting up for the future. Now this is a great beginning, and that part was fairly true to the books. It will only get crazier from here, and I love that. The other thing I did like was a change from the books, and it comes with the purpose of the Eye of the World. Now without getting into book spoilers, the book version of The Eye of the World was a bit underwhelming uh, and confusing, I think, to a lot of readers. I think that by saying this is the place where the boar was sealed, or possibly where the seals themselves are located, this makes it far more significant, 
and it actually makes more sense in the narrative. I think there is some foreshadowing going on here that book readers will pick up on if you're careful. Uh, I'll talk more about that one in my spoiler breakdown. So before moving to the things that I did not love from this episode, let me quickly thank the video sponsor, Audible.com. Audible is the world's largest supplier of audiobooks. If you were not already aware, the Wheel of Time audiobooks are really, really great, and it's a great way to read the series, or I should say, listen to the series. Additionally, Rosamund Pike has a new version of Eye of the World, on audiobook that's out, narrated by her, and I am greatly enjoying hearing her. Her accent is awesome, she gets very into the characters, she really goes all out for it. Now what's great is that you can get a free audiobook just for being a viewer of my channel. So you can pick up her copy of Eye of the World for yourself, even if you've never done audiobooks before. All you have to do is head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus and grab your free book. You can listen to it while you're driving, while you're cooking, it's that easy, you got a free book. So let's get back to the video. All right, it is time to talk about the things that I did not like. And this is actually very strange for me because this is sort of an opposite approach I've taken with the rest of the series so far. I typically do not get too worked up about plot changes in the series, if you have not noticed, mostly because I knew many of them were coming. And I understood not only that they were coming, but why they were made. And I thought some of the changes actually led to characters being closer in personality to their book counterparts, which is what they were after with the adaptation. Additionally, I know they're adapting the whole series, not the Eye of the World. This first season is not Eye of the World adapted, it's Wheel of Time adapted. Because of this, I'm not gonna review the show with, this is so different from the books, ah, every time something happens that's different from the books. That's not the way I'm coming at it from a review standpoint. I knew they were coming, I understood the changes. That being said, there were some choices they made in this episode that left me with kind of a, huh, face? And I don't mean these in the sense that they were bad television or that these changes sucked. In fact, they really didn't suck at all. I would imagine that somebody watching the series for the very first time without having read the books at all would have found this episode pretty excellent. And for the most part, I think that's true from the responses I've seen, but, there were some choices in deviating from the books in this episode that I think will have collateral damage later on, and I don't believe they were necessary changes. Now, I understand some of the changes can be explored in later episodes and in later seasons, and I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt to a degree that they may figure out these or explain them better, but I'm not sure I agree or understand these changes right now. So let me start with one that I think is not entirely the fault of the showrunners and is the easiest one for me to get over even if I still don't like it. And that was the very end with Matt staying outside the Waygate. What is becoming more obvious is this is the point in which Barney Harris left the show, or at least we can assume right now. If you are not aware, the Wheel of Time production was shut down due to COVID-19 and there was a significant amount of time between when the production ended and when it was started back up in early 2021. This is the point right now in the story where production stopped and it appears it is also the point in which Barney Harris, for whatever unannounced reason, did not return to the production. This caused them to have to rewrite the final two episodes, again, we're assuming here, without Barney, and they chose rather than to immediately recast Matt for the final two episodes, that would have been really jarring actually, so they cut him out instead. Again, that is not confirmed, but that does appear to be what happened because we know that Barney will be replaced by Donald Finn for season two. You can check out my video on that topic for more information on Donald Finn. But in any case, that ending felt not only poorly paced, but it left me with questions and not in the good way. Like what now for Matt? I suppose we'll have to wait and see, but it just felt very clunky, even if they didn't have much of a choice. But that was the easiest of these for me to dismiss. The more difficult changes come in the usage of the oath rod to force Moraine to swear an oath to obey the Amarlin and the change of the ways and that they now require channeling to operate. Let's start with the oath rod. This type of oath is very much against protocol for the Aes Sedai and is frowned upon greatly. Swearing a fourth oath is actually a major problem in the books and it's almost considered a crime. I'm not entirely sure why Moraine had to swear that oath to serve her penance in the first place. Because of the three oaths, she would have had to just say she would not return until the Amarlin commanded her and it would have accomplished the same thing because she can't lie. That sort of plot device is used in the books a lot. It could have been used here. So without getting into any spoilers, 
Using the Oath Rod now to do this takes away a few plot points later in the story, not only lessens their impact, but this just felt entirely unnecessary and just a way to throw the Oath Rod in for no apparent reason. Again, the scene was executed well, I thought it was emotional, and they may address this in the final two episodes, but it felt clunky to me. I just didn't feel like it was a change that was really necessary, so why'd they do it? The last of these issues was the fact that the Waygate required channeling to operate, and this is the primary one I have a problem with. Again, I will not spoil the backstory here, but this requires a complete rewrite of the origin of Waygates, what their function was, how they came to be, and ultimately some changes to the explanations about how certain things have happened in the story so far. By requiring channeling to operate them, this changes a bunch of things, not only later in the story, but things that will happen now-ish. So for instance, a certain person following them. In any case, they very well may explain these things later on, but to me, I don't get why the changes were made. And I think it affects quite a bit without a clear reward for the change. I'm always fine with a change that has merit and achieves some end to advance the characters or the plot. I'm not sure what was achieved with those specific changes. And that brings me back to where I started with this episode. As a standalone episode, I actually thought it was outstanding. Like, it started very strong, and until the last 15 minutes or so, it was clearly the best episode of the season. It also felt like it was building to an ending that never quite satisfied in the way the buildup suggested. I don't know if it was just me that felt that, but it felt like it was building to something that just didn't happen. So as a standalone episode, I would probably give this episode a very high score out of 10. But as an adaptation of The Wheel of Time, it drops to me due to some of the choices and the clunkiness of the ending with Matt, whether they're at fault for that or not. So if I'm scoring the episode, despite the episode being really technically good and having some amazing parts, I think it's gonna get an eight out of 10, possibly a 7.5 out of 10 for me. If not for the ending, I think it would have been a nine or a 9.5, honestly, especially if it had a really powerful ending. I just got the feeling it was building to something and then it fizzled out. And if they don't end up explaining sufficiently some of the changes, that score could drop in my head even further. But flip side of that, if they end up explaining these very well and these changes become, oh gosh, I see why they did that, it's possible this score in my head might jump. But as it stands, I'm leaning into the 7.5 or 8 out of 10 range. What did you think of the episode? Am I being too harsh on it? Am I not being harsh enough? What would you have scored it? Let me know in the comments of the video and keep it civil. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. There's quite a bit of it coming out. Also make sure to check out my older lore videos. I've got tons of playlists if you wanna dig into the Wheel of Time and I think you're gonna enjoy them. Thank you to my patrons for supporting the channel. Thank you to everybody for watching and until next time, peace out. Mm -hmm.